In Washington, D.C., crime had become epidemic. Gangs fought over drug turf, leaving corpses in their wake. The Metropolitan Police Force was overwhelmed as the homicide rate climbed to over 400 per year. Before officers could stem the tide of violence, they became the targets. A cop killer was on the loose, and police turned to the FBI to stop him. On January 10th, 1995, at a fast food restaurant in Northwest Washington, D.C., Metropolitan Police Officer Vance Warren was taking a dinner break while working part-time security. It had become common practice for businesses to hire uniformed off-duty police officers to protect their establishments. Everyone felt more secure, customers and employees alike. No one inside saw the dark figure retreat into the shadows. Two bullets grazed the back of the officer's neck. He peered out into the darkness looking for the shooter, then radioed for assistance. We got shots fired. He didn't know where the shots came from, or if the gunman was still out there, waiting to strike again. Responding officers raced to the scene but the gunman was nowhere in sight. There was no attempt at a robbery. It appeared the shooter's sole purpose was to kill the officer. From witness accounts, police believed the shooter acted alone. The forensic team recovered two 32 caliber slugs from inside the restaurant. No shell casings were found at the scene. Though Officer Vance Warren survived the shooting with only minor injuries, others weren't so lucky. Less than two months earlier, on November 22nd, a gang member walked into the District of Columbia's police headquarters with a gun and began firing. In an instant, the police sergeant and two federal agents were dead. A fourth was critically wounded. With no chance for escape, the killer turned the gun on himself. Police couldn't help but suspect the shootings were somehow connected, even though there was no evidence linking the attack on Officer Warren to the shooting at police headquarters. The attempted murder of the officer seemed like one more incident in an escalating war over drugs and turf. Metropolitan police were overwhelmed with the level of violence and the crushing caseloads. With at least one murder occurring each day, homicide detectives couldn't keep up. For Detective Lauren Ledman and his colleagues, their city was under siege. We rode the wave of the crack epidemic that came in paid a heavy toll on our citizens in the, in the uh, murder rate. We had a serious amount of cases. We had a lot of violence. We escalated to the uh, position of being per capita, uh, one of the worst in the nation. It was about to get even worse. On January 17th, a few blocks from the White House, Metropolitan Police Officer Eric Hayes was in his patrol car. A taxi cab double parked on the opposite side of the street. While the officer filled out paperwork, a man approached his cruiser. He shot the patrolman four times at close range. Wounded in his chest, legs, and abdomen, Officer Hayes struggled out of his vehicle. 
the cab driver witnessed the shooting. He reported it to his dispatcher. Look, just some set that went down the alleyway. As the shooter bolted, the cab driver circled around the block. Making his getaway, the gunman stripped off his mask and jacket in an attempt to change his appearance. When the cabbie turned the corner onto the next block, he saw the shooter emerge and alerted his dispatcher that the shooter hailed him. Not realizing the cabbie had witnessed the shooting and followed him, the assailant got in. The driver discreetly turned off his radio and the dispatcher notified police. Keep straight, man, keep straight. An APB was issued for taxi number 440. The driver tried to remain calm, hoping police would find his car. Within minutes, cops picked up the taxi's trail. The gunman barked a new address and told him to keep driving. In an instant, the driver slammed on the brakes. The assailant discarded his gun and ran. He evaded the pursuing officers. Police retrieved the weapon, which held six used shell casings, and called for backup to search the area. At the crime scene, Officer Hayes fought for his life. He survived emergency surgery where doctors removed four 32 caliber slugs. An officer called in a forensics unit to gather evidence. They scoured the crime scene. Before gathering any physical material, they photographed the entire area. In the alley, they found the clothing discarded by the assailant, including a black ski mask. They hoped clues revealed in the lab could lead to the shooter's identity. Fearing another blindside attack, the police chief ordered all officers to patrol with a partner and called in the FBI for assistance. Special Agent Jay Abbott was assigned the case. But what had happened up to that point led us to believe that, my God, we may be dealing with some sort of gang in D.C. that's just decided to take it upon themselves to, to declare war on the police and just start trying to kill police. Metropolitan Police fought back with forensics. They sent all physical evidence gathered from the crime scenes to the FBI laboratory, one of the foremost forensics labs in the world. Clothing recovered from the most recent shooting was forwarded to the hair and fiber unit. This unit works 2,500 cases a year from around the country. The DC cop shooting case was given top priority. After the clothes were scraped over a clean sheet of white paper, the surface was inspected carefully for artifacts. An examiner discovered a single head hair from the ski mask. When a suspect emerged, a sample of his hair would be compared to the one found. A match would be vital in a successful prosecution. The gun, the casings, and the recovered slugs were sent to the FBI's Firearms and Tool Marks Unit. Agents needed to determine if the 32 caliber revolver left by the assailant was the weapon used to shoot the officers. Every gun possesses distinct spiral grooves inside its barrel. 
When a bullet is fired, those grooves leave an imprint on the projectile. The grooves from a fresh bullet would be compared to the grooves on the recovered slugs to see if they corresponded. The bullet sample, together with the slugs, were forwarded to an analyst for scrutiny under the comparison microscope. The bullets matched. This confirmed that the 32 caliber revolver was the weapon used in the two most recent shootings. Investigators were now looking for one man. To find their suspect, the FBI and Metropolitan Police called on their only eyewitness, the cab driver. They asked him to provide a description of the assailant to a police sketch artist. The cabbie described an African-American man with a medium complexion and square jaw. The most distinguishing feature he remembered was that the gunman wore braces on his teeth. Investigators contacted area dentists and orthodontists to see if they recognized the man in the picture as one of their patients. The composite was also distributed through television, newspapers, and local business. A reward prompted hundreds of phone calls. Special Agent Jerry Bammel helped work the leads. Based on leads which we generated, telephone calls which we received, ide possible identifications from the dentists and orthodontists, we identified approximately 100 individuals who could have been suspects in this shooting of uh, the police officers. Investigators worked around the clock to narrow the field of suspects. Uh, we were working seven days a week on this case because it had a certain urgency to it, uh, given the fact that a subject was stalking police officers and attempting to kill them. Over several months, suspects were interviewed and eliminated one by one. Agents and detectives made no arrests. Thousands of investigative man hours had led nowhere. Then on April 26th, Officer John Novobilski of the Prince George's County, Maryland Police was hired to guard a liquor store in nearby Landover, a suburb of the District of Columbia. A masked gunman approached and fired at close range. He unloaded 16 rounds. The policeman never had a chance. Then he took the downed officer's 9mm pistol. From a nearby corner, a witness heard the shooting and called for help. But it would come too late. Officer Novobilski died instantly. Maryland police secured the area and interviewed the witness. There was no apparent motive, no warning, and the victim was a cop. The pattern seemed to match the two shootings in Washington. There was tremendous similarities between the killing of Sergeant John Novobilski and the wounding of our two police officers here in Washington, D.C., in that an individual walked up to a seated police officer and without provocation opened fire and shot the officer. Five months had passed since the first officer was shot. Agents were no closer to finding their suspect, and now he was wanted for murder. Washington police and FBI agents scoured the streets looking for the assailant who had wounded two of their colleagues. As they continued to hunt, Maryland police made an arrest for the murder of their officer. There was no evidence linking the Maryland suspect to the two attacks on DC police. Special Agent Jay Abbott believed the DC attacker was still at large and could strike again at any moment. But we felt this person was probably going to try to kill another police officer somewhere in Washington, D.C. or in the vicinity. And, and it gave us real pause for concern that uh, 
we weren't able to follow up any viable leads during that time. On May 18, 1995, while investigators continued their search in Washington, a young Maryland woman arrived at a Prince George's County precinct. Bruised and battered, Nadine McRae explained to the police officer that she had been beaten by her boyfriend. Accompanied by a supportive friend, Nadine began to detail the vicious assault she received at the hand of Ralph McLean. So nine o'clock last night. Agent Bammel recalls its severity. McLean tried to kill McRae uh, the evening of the 17th, which was the reason that she came forth to the police on the 18th. Uh, he beat her into unconsciousness. He stuffed drugs into her. All the information I need from you. The Prince George's County police officer issued an arrest warrant charging McLean with attempted murder. He recommended that Nadine get a thorough medical examination. On the way out, Nadine's friend pleaded with her to tell the officer the reason McLean had almost beaten her to death. Nadine hesitated. She was afraid of what else McLean might do if she said anything more. Reluctantly, she told the police officer what she knew. The night the sketch of the suspect appeared on the television news three months before, she was surprised to see McLean prying the braces off his teeth. When she questioned him, McLean screamed at her to mind her own business. According to Nadine, her boyfriend, Ralph McLean, was not only responsible for the shootings in Washington, he was also a cop killer. Her boyfriend had advised her that they uh, had the wrong person for the uh, shooting that occurred in Landover, Maryland with Officer Novobilsky. She provided the break that agents were looking for. Okay, Nadine, I'm going to call another detective who's handling this. Nadine McRae, so reluctant to speak at first, yeah, speak knew that you? now there was no going back. I think she realized how dangerous the person was and was very willing to cooperate with us. Because I think at that point she also realized that her own life was in danger now, uh, having uh, revealed uh, her knowledge of uh, the uh, subject. Agents entered Ralph McLean's name into the NCIC, the National Crime Information Center, to find out if their suspect had any prior convictions. For Agent Bammel, the database revealed that McLean was no stranger to crime. He had a long history of criminal activity here in Washington, D.C., totaling over 20 arrests. Those arrests were for some petty crimes, shoplifting, but they did escalate to uh, assault on police officer, drug distribution type charges also. Investigators secured a search warrant for McLean's apartment. It was a very tense uh, time just to go into that residence uh, with the possibility that he could be there uh, and with all the tension of uh, realizing what they might find. McLean wasn't home. Investigators began searching the apartment. Survivalist magazines, weapons manuals, and how-to guides for terrorist operations were strewn everywhere. The materials detailed how to conduct surveillance, conceal movements, and catch victims by surprise. In the living room, the forensic team uncovered a black ski mask similar to the one found at the second shooting. They also discovered 9mm cartridges, the same type used in the assault that killed the Maryland officer. In a cabinet, they found more ammunition, this time for a 32 caliber weapon. 
that's very important to us because the shooter of Sergeant Eric Hayes and Officer Vance Warren used a 32 caliber revolver in that shooting. Also, a manual for a Mac 11 assault weapon was found. And additionally, lots of writings of anti-police type hatred were found within the residence. Forensics examiners searched for strands of hair to compare to the one found previously. The team took samples from hairbrushes, bed sheets, even the drain in the bathroom sink. If hairs from McLean's apartment matched the hair recovered from the crime scene, agents would have forensic evidence against the fugitive. Armed with a photograph of a suspect, detectives called on the cab driver. They asked him to look at a photo lineup to see if he could identify McLean as the man who shot Officer Hayes. Metropolitan Police Detective Lauren Ledman was there for the lineup. The cab driver had always told us that uh, if you ever you know, show me a picture of the guy, I will recognize him. You know, you hear that, right? But I mean, he said it with a lot of passion. Investigators handed photos to the witness one at a time. He studied each carefully. When he was handed the fourth photo, the whole terrifying incident came flooding back. He was staring into the face of Ralph McLean. He was talking to the picture as if Ralph McLean was there. He was talking to him through the picture. It was the best identification I've ever seen. I mean, he's screaming at this picture. Investigators now had two witnesses who pointed to Ralph McLean as the cop killer. Science would be the third witness. At the FBI labs, examiners matched the hair samples retrieved from McLean's apartment to the hair recovered earlier from the clothing found at the Officer Hayes shooting. It was the critical piece investigators needed to secure an arrest warrant for Ralph McLean. At that point, we were armed with uh, some very serious evidence. Um, we had the girlfriend with the admission. We had uh, uh, hairs, and we drafted an affidavit for signature for a Superior Court judge. And in the middle of the night, we went out and we obtained that warrant. But first, they had to find McLean. Investigators canvassed all of his known haunts. The suspected cop killer had apparently fled the area, and agents had no idea where he was headed. Ralph McLean was wanted for shooting three police officers in and around Washington, D.C., killing one. A month had passed since the last shooting, and investigators had no clues to his whereabouts. To find him, they looked to his girlfriend, Nadine, for help. She was under constant police protection since McLean had tried to kill her. Nadine spoke with McLean through his cell phone. He was not aware that investigators were listening. Through their conversation, Special Agent Jay Abbott and his team were able to track McLean's movements. We were able to locate him at one point uh, in the Fredericksburg, uh, uh, Virginia area, and uh, we're very close to making an arrest at that, at that time, but unfortunately, uh, he was able to evade uh, our attempts. Their conversations continued over two more days. Authorities learned that McLean was traveling south to Florida, but he never gave Nadine a specific location. Investigators wondered if McLean knew his girlfriend was cooperating with police. She told them that he monitored the news constantly on a portable TV. If they were going to catch McLean, they needed to surprise him and keep his name out of the media. That meant keeping the arrest warrant out of the national system.
In South Carolina, that decision would work against them when a highway patrolman pulled him over for a moving violation. The officer approached and asked to see a driver's license and vehicle registration. McLean showed him his registration and claimed his license was in the trunk. The South Carolina officer, just weeks away from retirement, followed him to the rear of the automobile. McLean rifled through his belongings and pulled out his license. The officer told McLean to return to his vehicle while he called in to see if he had any outstanding moving violations. He also checked to see if the car had been reported stolen. Records indicated that it was legally registered to Ralph McLean. He issued McLean a ticket, then gave him directions to the town's magistrate's office to pay the fine. The officer survived the incident, but authorities had missed an opportunity to capture the cop killer. Back in Washington, Detective Lauren Ledman looked for a way to lure him back to the area. We were faced with somebody that was mentally unstable, that was uh, out actively shooting police officers. We were kind of at his mercy because he was calling the shots. And the, the key was is we needed to get him nailed down in the location where we could surround him. Investigators once again depended on Nadine's help. They advised her to promise McLean a reconciliation if he returned. Hey, you want to meet somewhere? McLean said he was interested in the offer, though he wouldn't agree to when or where they would meet again. Investigators worried that they were losing the element of surprise. We were looking for a little bit of an edge, but that edge was uh, taken away from us. The media found out about it. They broadcast his name, um, his photograph, and so forth, which really bothered us because it brought us to another heightened level. They hoped McLean hadn't seen the broadcast. On Memorial Day weekend, McLean called Nadine. He was ready to meet with her. As instructed by the FBI, Nadine suggested meeting at a large shopping mall in Northern Virginia a place where agents could maintain surveillance without being noticed. What I do is I'll, I'll call you when I get to the McLean agreed to the location. The information was relayed to agents in Washington. Special Agent Al Buckley, in charge of the arrest plan, was notified. He called the FBI SWAT team that had been on standby for several days. When I heard the information that Mr. McLean was heading back to the Virginia or Washington, D.C. area, I felt that Mr. McLean was coming up to do two things, either to kill Nadine and possibly kill an additional police officer. Agents and D.C. officers arrived at the mall in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. Their first task was to set up a perimeter. They had to be certain that once McLean arrived, he would not slip through. Collectively, the team had decades of experience. This should have been a routine operation. I've been involved in, in several arrest situations where meetings are held before the arrests, and a lot of times uh, there's a lot of joking around just to relieve the tension. I'd have to say that that night was a little bit different. It was quiet, and that's probably the first time in my FBI career that uh, I could just cut the silence with a knife. The team finalized plans and waited for word that McLean arrived. 
At the Prince George's County Police Station, where Nadine kept in contact with McLean, the dispatcher relayed information to agents in the field. Agent Buckley got the call. McLean had changed the rendezvous location. The fugitive wanted to meet Nadine in Maryland, nearly 25 miles away from where the SWAT team had assembled. The sudden change of plans was troubling. The call suggested that McLean might have known he was being set up. Wanted cop killer Ralph McLean was on his way to a Greenbelt, Maryland plaza to confront his girlfriend, Nadine. An FBI SWAT team was racing there to intercept him. Since McLean had changed the location from Tyson's Corner, Virginia, investigators suspected the armed fugitive knew Nadine was cooperating with authorities. Special Agent Jay Abbott was gravely concerned. At the time, we began to sense that he had suspicions uh, of uh, what was happening. And, and given those suspicions, uh, that added to the sense of urgency even more. Uh, we weren't sure that he would uh, actually show up at one of these locations to meet Nadine. He might begin to smell that there was a trap. As they got closer, agents turned off their blue light and constantly monitored the radio. A police dispatcher relayed updates to agents in the field. He kept them posted on McLean's plans, learned through conversations with Nadine. Agents were at the mercy of the fugitive's whims. After changing the location several times, the team got word that McLean decided to meet at a gas station across from Beltway Plaza. They scrambled to set up a perimeter around the gas station. Agents hoped they would have enough time to secure the area. Once in place, they would wait for McLean to either show up or call Nadine. Detective Ledman took his position in a field across from the gas station. He believed McLean would show up to see Nadine despite suspicions of a trap. We didn't even know if he even really wanted to meet her. We just felt that he was just trying to get in shooting range of her to kill her. Why? Because she was the only ear witness to this shooting of this police officer. As the team continued to assemble, Nadine remained at police headquarters on the cell phone with McLean. Securing the closest position to the gas station, 20-year veteran agent Billy Christian arrived. The schoolyard across the street offered the best vantage point. If McLean appeared, Agent Christian would be the first to see him. Other team members set up on nearby streets, hoping to spot McLean's car as it approached. Pressure mounted as they waited and watched. It was very tense. Yeah, Al Buckley and I were sitting in a vehicle together just uh, a couple hundred yards away, trying to direct the activity of a number of people. And it was very tense. I remember uh, saying to him when we were in the car, I, I just hope that we can get him without anybody getting hurt. Finally, the team was notified that the suspect had called Nadine. He complained that he didn't see her at the gas station. McLean was in the area, but agents couldn't get a precise fix. Investigators believed he was very close. This particular time, he was whispering, which led me to believe that somebody was close to him, which caused me to look around and see was I on top of him and didn't know it. Hidden behind a small hill, Detective Ledman checked the gas station again. But he still didn't see McLean. Scanning to his right, the detective could see Christian's car. 
From his position, Christian also surveyed the area, but he too saw no trace of the fugitive. At that point, a local officer out on his regular patrol approached Christian's car from behind. The patrolman, unaware of the arrest plan, thought the agent's car seemed suspicious. Bill Christian, uh, to his credit, realized and recognized the danger that the uh, officer was in and, and exited his vehicle, walked to the vehicle, and showed him his credentials. Uh, that action probably identified Bill Christian to uh, Ralph McLean as a law enforcement person. The officer turned off his lights and pulled away from the scene. Christian resumed his surveillance. While investigators watched for McLean, he was watching them. The element of surprise and the tactical advantage was McLean's. Well camouflaged in dark clothes, he surveyed the car where Agent Christian sat waiting and watching. He advanced slowly and deliberately on Christian's position. Agents knew he was out there, somewhere. Anxieties ran high since McLean's calls to Nadine had stopped. The cop killer continued to advance. With Christian's gaze fixed on the gas station, McLean stalked the agent. FBI agents and DC detectives surrounded a gas station in Greenbelt, Maryland, waiting for cop killer Ralph McLean to show himself. The arrest team knew he was close, but they didn't know where. McLean was advancing on agent Billy Christian from the shadows. Christian heard something turned to look, but saw nothing. He heard it again, glanced around, but no one was there. McLean's low profile hid him below the agent's line of sight. The killer continued to advance on his unsuspecting prey. Rising just beyond the agent's line of sight, McLean lifted his Mac-11 machine gun and aimed it at Christian. Muzzle bursts ripped through the night air. Agent Billy Christian slumped in his seat. Detective Ledman spotted McLean sprinting into the woods and called for backup. The detective pulled the bleeding agent from the car, laid him flat, and made a second call for assistance. Agents Jay Abbott and Al Buckley were among the first to respond. Uh, we heard a, um, a call come over the radio of shots fired and that the subject is running. When we pulled up on Billy Christian's car, we realized that Billy had been shot, the window had been blown out. Detective Ledman tried to help the fallen agent before rescue units arrived. 
He had been hit on the blind side to his left at a 45 degree angle. He had been hit several times and um, he was dead. The cop killer had claimed another life. This person had just killed a colleague, uh, not just a colleague, but a, a, a good friend, uh, a mentor to some of us. He had been around for a long time, a 20-year agent. And, and to have this happen was enraging. Units from several jurisdictions responded instantly. A Prince George's County officer arrived with a police dog and started to hunt for McLean in the dark. I remember him running up to Billy's car. I remember him looking at Billy and sniffing at the door, door area and then turning around and trying to make a beeline back toward the school. The team tore off into the darkness with the dog and their semi-automatic weapons. They didn't know if they were walking into another trap. We started into the wooded area. I had my flashlight out and I remember just clicking on my flashlight on and off because at that point I was afraid that if I kept the beam on, that Mr. McLean would be able to focus in on either one of us. The darkness worked in McLean's favor. We went into the woods in an attempt to at least try to locate uh, which way he went or where he went. And, and it was probably a, a, an error in judgment to do that when I look at it in retrospect, but that's how high the emotions were at the time. The team pressed on, but McLean had enough of a lead to plan a deception. As he ran away from the scene uh, after just shooting Bill Christian, he had the wherewithal uh, to call 911 and report that he saw a man with a gun uh, leaving the area in a vehicle. Uh, this was an obvious attempt to try to uh, throw those of us who were in pursuit uh, in another direction to try to aid in his escape. Tracing the call, agents knew he was still in the area, but they didn't know exactly where. It appeared the fugitive cop killer had evaded authorities once again. He ran through the parking lot of the nearby plaza. The team was infuriated by the senseless murder of Billy Christian. They steeled themselves to continue the pursuit. Agents and local investigators alike vowed to stop the cop killer before he killed again. Anger was probably the the biggest feeling that I had that night. Uh, frustration, Frust I was frustrated that we're all not going home tonight. Billy has to stay here. As agents Buckley and Abbott continued to track the fugitive's path through the woods, Detective Ledman received a call from investigators positioned in the parking lot of the plaza. Mr. McLean had run and gotten behind the uh, store and had a large ramp that leads up to the back of the store where there was um, three trailers and he had secluded himself behind those. McLean opened fire on pursuing officers. They took cover on the ground and returned fire. Emerging from the woods, Agents Abbott and Buckley saw officers being fired upon. They pulled their guns and joined in the fight. McLean was dug in and well armed. Officers were pinned down. No one knew how to get to him without losing another life. FBI SWAT team member Jerry Bammel arrived on the scene. He aimed at the fugitive, but didn't have a clear shot. He saw an opportunity to flank McLean and maneuvered to his right. While police and agents traded fire with the cop killer, Bammel remained hidden from McLean. 
Then he stepped out from behind the dumpster and began firing on the shooter from the opposite side. From his position, Bamel noticed that McLean had a possible escape route. The loading dock ended with a railing and then a 10-foot drop wall. And I realized that McLean could conceivably get over that wall and flee into the lower parking area where there were no agents or officers at the time. Bamel blocked McLean's exit with gunfire. Now McLean was receiving fire from two different positions. He swung around and sprayed rounds where Bamel was standing. The agent returned fire. McLean was hit. Agents and officers continued firing. McLean fired one more round. Then there was silence. I waited a moment, and then there was a call out, something like, he's down, he's down. Bamel hesitated before advancing on McLean's position to be sure this wasn't another trick. While officers and agents waited in the lot with guns at the ready, Agent Bamel made his way alongside the trailer, approaching the motionless figure. Another agent advanced on the opposite side. As they moved in, an officer yelled from the darkness that he saw movement. He was going to fire two more rounds towards McLean. As soon as he yelled that, I yelled, don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot, because I was immediately concerned of the fact that we were, had placed ourselves into a deadly crossfire situation. It was over. McLean had shot himself with a 9mm pistol, the same weapon he had taken from Officer Novobilsky, who he murdered a month earlier. The cop killer was dead, but the price was steep. Uh, this person, uh, this subject, uh, had one goal in mind, in my opinion, and that was uh, to kill police officers. And why, I, I will never know, but uh, it appears, it was apparent to me that that was what he had decided to do for whatever reason at some point in his life. Agent Billy Christian was close to retirement when he was gunned down. He had worked with Agent Bamel over the span of his long career. Billy had been a 20-year agent with the FBI. Billy was an expert marksman, a firearms instructor, one of the first members of the FBI's hostage rescue team, the full-time special weapons and tactics team, and he was also a member of the Washington Field SWAT team. The names of Agent William Christian and Officer John Novobilsky were added to the Law Enforcement Memorial, commemorating those who have fallen in the line of duty. My desk here at the FBI overlooks the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial, and not a day goes by that I don't think of my friends. Their sacrifice remains vivid and is recalled each Memorial Day. There is a feeling when you lose a brother or sister, agent, and officer, that a part of you is lost, and they will never be forgotten. <laughs>